Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Was salatu was salamu ala khatim al-anbiya wa imam al mursaleen And may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the seal of the prophets and the leader of the messengers, al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi ajma'een, and upon his household and entire companions. Dear viewers, I greet you all with the best of greetings. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Meaning, may the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you all. You're welcome to another episode of Walking the Talk. And on today's episode, inshallah, will be looking at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a model, as um, an exemplary figure, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about him, that verily we have made you uswatun hasana, we have made you the best of examples for the entire mankind, for the entire human race. And when it comes to walking the talk of belief, of belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is none that exemplify this like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and their numerous narrations that we would all probably have held on to and that would have helped us in our journey in life and in practice as well. Uh, for a lot of us who had gone through difficulties, whatever form or facet of that difficulty, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had faced more or faced similar or faced to a degree that we can all connect and relate to him, not just as believers, as Muslims alone, but humanity in general. And that's why he was considered as one of the most influential, till date, the most influential um, individual by many, many um, contemporary individuals or contemporary writers and even writers um, of the past who had looked at his life strategically and looked at everything that he faced and also looked at his achievements and most importantly looked at his impact in the life of so many, especially the then Arabs who practiced a culture that was so terrible, that was so inhumane, yet they were able to find peace and find guidance and put aside their worries and put aside their wars and put aside all of their customs and traditions that were completely, completely devoid of any form of humanity. And yet, and, and today, Alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa Jal elevated the people who practice and who followed in the footsteps of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and that is the ummah um, which we all fall under. But did it just come to him in such a manner? And are we all supposed to just experience that, oh, because we are Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not test us. This is why in emulating his life and in studying his life, we derive lessons that are so powerful for us that they impact us till our meeting with our Creator. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala count us amongst the Ummah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Now we'll start with his uh, early life, and this is uh, pre-Nubuwa, this is pre-Prophethood. Um, we all remember that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even before he was given the mantle of leadership, the mantle of prophethood, he was described as al-Amin, the trustworthy. Before he took any responsibility, there was already that very important trait that he observed and that he exhibited, which was that he was trustworthy, which was that whatever he said he would do, he would do it. And whatever he stayed away from, he stayed away from it. Anything that was obscene, that was obnoxious, anything that was seen as a form of injustice, the Prophet wasallam, before guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, stayed away from such. And so it showed that even from his early life and the early stages of his life, he was able to suppress any form of evil engagements and this was by the help and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we remember the narration of what happened while he was playing as a young boy when or while he was a young boy when uh, Malaikal Jibreel came in the form of a man and cut open his chest and took out the black dot from the chest or the black item from the chest and washed his chest with Zamzam and made it so pure and placed the heart back in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated him through that but there are also lessons that we must learn not just through this particular incident that happened in his life that made him stay away from anything of evil he also developed such a character as well he developed himself to the degree that he was noted in his community as al-amin the trustworthy and this also made him or uh, made him earn the trust and the um, the respect of many that were way older than him and the elders in the community and ultimately his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha, our mother, the mother of the believers or one of the mothers of the believers Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. 
Now the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, having uh, achieved this level in his life, um, was now began to you know, reflect on his society, reflect on his community. And he would go into uh, long states of i'tikaf, of seclusion, seclusion away from the people. And he would go to the cave of Hira. And while he was in the cave, as we remember, um, in numerous occasions that he had done this for numerous times, on this particular time while he was there, a being came while he was in the cave. And subhanAllah, for anyone who has performed uh, and visited Mecca, and you've performed Hajj, or you've performed Umrah, and if you've had the opportunity to go to where this cave Hira is, it's a cave that is all the way high up, you know, on the mountain, uh, Mount, uh, and this, this mountain where you will find the cave, subhanAllah, is such a distance from the city of Mecca that anyone at that time who would travel such a distance would have to go for hours, if not for days even. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would travel all the stretch from the city, leaving the entire city, and go into this cave to seclude himself, where there was no human being, there was no sign of any human being. So imagine having done this for numerous periods in his life, and on this particular day, while he is in the cave, a being comes to him, and he sees this being at the mouth of the cave and just at the mouth of the cave the being looks at him and says to him Iqra. imagine the fear imagine the trepidation that he must have had when he saw this being from nowhere that it was obvious this person had been able to make it to this location and yet he had no signs of anything on him, so it was a scary experience. And that's why the Rasul ﷺ, in describing what had happened, and when he was held and he was asked by Malaikul Jibreel to read, and he said, Ma ana biqari, until the very verses that were revealed, as we all know, of Surah Al Iqra, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq, Iqra wa rabbuka al akram, alladhi allama bil qalam, allama al insana ma lam ya'lam. These were the verses that were read to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who had said, I do not know how to read and yet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentioned to him or began this revelation to him that read Iqra. And this connotes the importance of knowledge in Islam. It is so important, my dear viewers, that anything we must do must be based on knowledge in Islam. Knowledge is the most important because it is the foundation of our practice. How can a person worship if they do not have knowledge? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to seek for knowledge and let and he has also described to us very much in detail in the Quran about the daraja of those who are knowledgeable being above anyone else. وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا لِعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has risen the daraja, the value of those who are knowledgeable amongst his servants. And another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْأُلَمَاءِ That verily those amongst my servants who are fearful of me, who are truly fearful of me, are those with knowledge, those who know. Because you have to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you can worship him. تَعْبُدُونِ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَعْرِفُونِ that know me before you worship me. That if you do not know me, then how can you worship me? How can you worship Allah and know about the attributes of Allah and know about his might and know about his significance and his magnificence as well if we do not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Allah wants us to know him and that's why the very first um, revelation as we learn was Surah Al-Iqra or from Surah Al-Iqra where Malaika Jibreel met the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the cave of Hira and said to him, read. Now, with this incident that had occurred, the Prophet ﷺ was fearful. He, you know, he was, he felt that he was out of his mind. He felt that he was losing it. And who was the first person he ran to seek her help and seek comfort and seek solace in her arms? This was his wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she was the one who held on to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and covered him and gave him words of encouragement, good words that would make him see that he was not a mental case, he was not going, he was not losing his mind, he was truly a gifted person, someone who was kind, someone who was generous, someone who stood for the oppressed. And these were the qualities that the Rasul's wife sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that is Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, told him, narrated to him, said about him, so that he would know that, look, 
You are not just any human being, any ordinary human being. You are a person that is good. You are a person that wants good for others and you exhibit good. So surely this does not mean you are losing your mind or you are becoming mental. However, we will go to my relative, my uncle, Waraka bin Nawfal, who will tell us about this incident. And it was during that particular encounter with Waraka bin Nawfal that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was told that he had been met by one of the messenger or by the messenger amongst the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who was sent to every prophet and this confirmed to him that he would be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would not just make him the prophet, a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, but the seal of prophethood as after him, there would be no other prophet thereafter. Khatim al Nabiyyin. He is the seal of prophethood. Subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned this in the Noble Quran. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had mentioned this in numerous ahadith, stating that none would come after him except that there would be the ulama who would be the warathat al anbiya, there will be the inheritors of the uh, prophets after him being the seal of prophets alhamdulillah and rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam during his lifetime and during his message we would learn that he would begin to preach in makkah and while he was preaching in makkah as uh, as we all learn he preached about allah preached to people about knowing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the oneness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and during this time he faced all manners of trials he faced all manners of difficulties. People turned away from him. People persecuted him to the degree that he went to a town, Ta'if. And this town, you know, the Rasul had a lot of compassion and love for children. And while he was in Ta'if, children were set against him and they began to stone him till he fell and he bled. Yet, this did not deter him from his message to call to the path of Allah with goodness and kind words and good speech. We'll take a short break now, inshallah, and when we return, we'll continue the episode of walking, to, walking the Talk, looking at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to uh, the program. And alhamdulillah, today on uh, today's episode, we're looking at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, as walking the talk and how he went through uh, numerous trials. And before he was given the mantle of leadership or the mantle of nubuwa, that is prophethood, how he lived, how he was known as the trustworthy, and when he was given the very incident that occurred in the cave of Hira, and how during the period he stayed in Mecca, he called people to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He called them to Tawheed, and while calling them to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he went through all manners of trials, from the times where he had to hide and go into a very small location to preach to people, to call people to Allah, to call them away from the worship of idols. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولٍ أَنِ اللَّهَ اللَّهَ وَجِتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and verily we had raised from every nation a messenger that calls people to the worship of Allah, Allah and for them to stay away from any form of ta'ud. These are all um, things that are worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, Allah Azza wa Jal, in respect to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, didn't say he was raised from a nation. As the other prophets that came were raised for specific nations of people that they were sent to. But the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah tells us about him, rahmatul lil alameen. He was raised as a mercy for the entire mankind. Salawatullahi wa salamu wa he was raised as a mercy for mankind and that's why he was so filled with concern about the guidance of mankind and guiding as many as he could to the fold of the faith. But before his message would spread far and wide, he faced so many challenges. And I was talking just, in the, just before the break about the particular incident that happened where the Prophet wasallam went to the city of Taif. And this is a city that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today has made to be one of the cornerstones of Islam. Islam in the entire world and in, specifically in the Arabian Peninsula. However, before then, he had gone to this town and he was going to preach to them. And the people of the town set 
on the Prophet وسلم, those amongst the creation of Allah whom he loved the most and those were children. He was very compassionate to children. He loved them. He treated them with honor and dignity and respect. He never put them aside, never hurt their feelings, never made them feel like they were irrelevant. The Rasul وسلم, was very soft and very gentle to them. And so imagine the, the beings that he would love and cherish the most. Imagine them being set on him to stone him while he was in the city and on the streets of Ta'if to the degree that the Prophet وسلم, fell and began to bleed from his head and became unconscious. And you know, this was one of the most um, uh, the, one of the most interesting points in the life of the Prophet It was a point where he acknowledged his weakness. You know, sometimes when we do da'wah, when we call people to Islam, when we are faced with all manners of challenges because of our faith, there are those times when we are strong, when our iman is so strong that we feel we can battle everyone. But then there are those times when it gets to us, when the words of people actually affect us, when people who maybe we might have not cared that they talked bad about our beards or talked bad, uh, talked bad about us because we wore the hijab or have the niqab on or they look down on us. There are those times when it does hit, where it does make you feel like, what is it? Is this what I have to go through for, the, for my faith, the persecution I have to experience? The Rasul وسلم, experienced that as well. But what did he do? Who did he call on to? He called on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he mentioned to Allah that, Oh Allah, I recognize before you my weakness. My weakness before you is so great. Oh Allah, grant me goodness, grant me strength from you. He called on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because sometimes it takes us being broken for us to know that we have none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu found himself in such situations in numerous times in his life. Whether at the early stages while he was preaching and facing persecution in those early stages. And that persecution he faced is today what billions across the globe are enjoying. We are all benefiting. We are all part of his ummah today, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because he was perseverant, because he was patient, because he didn't turn away from those whom he was asked to go and guide. And he didn't reciprocate the harm that they had done to him in a state of anger or in a state of loss. Instead, he recognized his weakness and prayed to Allah for strength, and even prayed for those as well who had harmed him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine this level of patience. Imagine this level of perseverance. Imagine this level of love and compassion. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ عَنْفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ These verses are so beautiful that when you sit and you ponder on it, it touches your heart, it tugs your heart to the degree that you even begin to shed tears. Allah says to us about the Prophet وسلم, Verily there has come from amongst you a Prophet, a messenger similar to your like, that he is in your likeness, in your similitude. It is so grave and heavy for him that any harm should come to you. He is hurriedly wanting for you, the believers, for goodness to come to you and for you to find peace and find joy and for you to earn the salvation before your Rabb on the day of resurrection. And if you turn away from his guidance, فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ Allah then he would simply say, Allah is sufficient for me. La ilaha illahu, none has the right to be worshipped except him. Alayhi tawakkalt, upon him do we depend. Wa huwa rabbul arsh al -azim. And he is the Lord of the mighty arsh, the throne that exists, subhanAllah. This is whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described to us. And that's why in his life, in his lifetime, and all of the challenges that he faced, he was able to walk and stand tall. And he walked the talk of belief, of faith, of la ilaha illallah. He didn't just utter the words with his tongue alone. He didn't just believe it in his heart alone. He worked completely till the last breath that he took on the surface of this earth. And he returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He returned to Allah seeking only his pleasure. He was giving the opportunity to have of this world and have of the hereafter, but instead he uttered the words, إِلَىٰ رَفِيقِ الْأَعْلَىٰ To the Most High, to the Most High. The Prophet ﷺ faced the challenges 
of da'wah, of being looked down upon and being turned away from. He faced the challenges of losing his loved ones, especially those who didn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine his uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib was his uncle who loved him, who catered for him, who cared for him. Yet his uncle will die not on the faith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet here you and I are and we practice this faith. And we hope to see him at his fountain, at the Haud, at Kawthar. We hope to be from his Ummah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we pray that Allah resurrects us with him and amongst those who he loves and also those who loved him just as the companions were. May Allah be pleased with them as well. This is the benefit that we get from being in the Ummah of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we can be from amongst those who will stand with him and he would recognize us even without seeing us in his lifetime. He would recognize us through those parts of our bodies that will shine, that will have the lights that illuminate from them because of the areas of wudu where we used to perform our wudu and those who will come on that day will be known as Gurrul Muhajjaloon, those where those that have the lights that are reflecting, that are shining shining from their bodies because of the areas of ablution of wudu where they used to perform frequently would be like light on that particular day. And the light that will, they will emit is a light that will be so bright, subhanAllah, that it would make us to be amongst those that will earn the pleasure of our Lord. May Allah count us from amongst them. Remember also that he lost his family. He lost his children. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was blessed with six children from Nana. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and Ibrahim from uh, Maymun al qabtiyah He was blessed with seven children. All seven left this world, returned to Allah in his lifetime with the exception of one. And that was Fatima who was described as Ummu Abiha radiallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with her. Fatima was the only child of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that remained before his passing. And yet she was the first from his family to join him after he had returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was tested with loss of wealth. He was tested with loss of friends, of loved ones, those who went to the battle. When you remember the battle of Uhud, due to the brief disobedience of the companions or some of the companions who had been commanded by the Prophet ﷺ to remain stationed at a particular point during the Battle of Uhud. But yet they had, some had seen the Ghanima and in their hurry to proclaim victory, left that position for one moment and they went after the Ghanima and Allah caused a, um, a severe defeat to come upon them. But yet it was not a defeat but a victory as well still. Why was it still victory for them? Because in Islam and for the believers and for the Muslims, we remember and we learn that when you are in the path of jihad, there, is either, there are either two forms of success. There is either shahada or there is nasr. Nasr min Allah aw shahada. There is the victory Allah gives or there is the shahada where you return to Allah and you still meet with Allah in goodness. In that particular battle, a lot of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ attained shahada, including his uncle Hamza, who was most beloved to him, and companions like Mus'ab bin Umair, radiallahu anhu, the one that was also known as Mus'ab al-Khayr. You also had Julaybib, radiallahu anhu, and so many other companions of the Prophet ﷺ that passed on, that till today, when you visit the city of Medina, and you go to the Mount of Uhud to experience the battle that took place, you are, we are all admonished and advised to visit Shuhada'ul Uhud, to visit the martyrs of Uhud, and you will get there and see them and make dua for them and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them and grant them Jannah. He faced all of these manners of trials. He faced the trial of sickness, of illness, to the degree that the Prophet ﷺ at some point couldn't even stand to observe the prayer again. And this was in the last part of his life, the closing part of his life, where in illness, he didn't stop worshipping Allah. He didn't stop calling on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he walked the talk to the last breath that he took from this earth. And these are the lessons that we must learn as believers today. That every challenge that we think that we are experiencing or that exists, 
it existed before, especially in the life of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We've come to the end of today's edition, inshallah, and join us again for our next episode where we'll be looking at the life of the companions and that will be the final close on this particular series of Walking the Talk or Walk the Talk. And I ask that may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us amongst those who walk the talk of faith. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.